Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar. My name is Ray Kim. I'm the chief of the division of gastroenterology and hepatology at Stanford University School of Medicine. This evening's webinar is part of our series that we call Eating Right Digestive Health Series that we put together for this summer. Tonight's presentation is the fourth installment in our series, and it focuses on dietary therapy for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Before I introduce the presenters for this evening, I'd like to let you know that the previous three webinars are archived as YouTube videos, and there are three more coming up after this week's presentation, so look out for those as well. We have five presenters for this evening, and it tells us that it takes a multidisciplinary approach in addition to dietary therapy to deliver good care for fatty liver patients. The first presenter is Dr. Amanda Chung, who is a pathologist, will discuss stages of fatty liver. The second presenter is our main event, Ms. Yvonne Fong, who is a liver dietitian, who will discuss diet and nutrition for fatty liver. The third presenter is Ms. Sandy Salem, who is our clinical pharmacist, discussing medications used for fatty liver. The fourth presenter is Dr. Filza Hussein, who is our psychiatrist, who will address behavioral and mental barriers to weight loss. And the fifth presenter will be Dr. H.S. Ahmed, our senior hepatologist, who put together this multidisciplinary program, so he will discuss that as well. We have prepared uh, questions and answer sessions after the presentations, so look forward to that as well. So without further ado, I'm introducing you to Dr. H.S. Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray, for this wonderful introduction. I'm Ijaz Ahmed. I'll be your moderator today. And welcome to the Stanford Medicine Digestive Health Series, Eating Right, a Healthy Fatty Liver Diet. I'm very excited to present this program to you. This is actually what we do in our clinics. And with that, let's go over the learning goals. We will discuss with you the stages of fatty liver, understand the role of lifestyle intervention on fatty liver disease, learn what and how to prevent, treat, and reverse fatty liver by changing our diet, physical activity, and the role of medications. Finally, we'll get into behavioral and mental barriers to weight loss, and then summarize our multidisciplinary approach that we follow in our liver clinic. Here are our speakers and panelists. Amanda Chung, one of our star hepatologists, will discuss stages of fatty liver disease. Yvonne Fong, the liver dietitian, will discuss diet and nutrition for fatty liver, followed by Sandy Salem, our clinical pharmacist, who will discuss medications for fatty liver. Filza Hussein, our psychiatrist, will go over behavioral and mental barriers to weight loss. And then I'll summarize our multidisciplinary approach followed by a Q&A session. We will have at least 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A session. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Amanda Chung, who is one of our star hepatologists, uh, and she'll go over the stages of fatty liver with you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for that introduction. It's a pleasure being here today to talk with you all. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the stages of fatty liver disease and um, how we can go about getting reversal. When we talk about fatty liver disease, the global term that we're referring to is what we abbreviate as NAFLD, which stands for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There are several stages of NAFLD, which you'll see on the screen here. On the second from the left, that box, it's what we call steatosis, which is the medical term for fat. So that's when we see fat in the liver. Steatosis in the liver or from a fatty liver disease is actually quite common and the rates are rising over time. At the current moment, we think about one in three to one in four patients have fatty liver disease of some sort. Then on the next box, the third one, or the middle box of the five, that is what we term NASH or N-A-S-H, which stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. hepatitis. That occurs when the fat in the liver is starting to cause inflammation or irritation to the liver. 
about one in three people who have steatosis will go on to develop NASH or steatohepatitis. And then next, when you have long-standing NASH or inflammation in the liver, you will start to develop scarring, which we call fibrosis. And there are stages of fibrosis when we rate them on a liver biopsy, for instance, the fibrosis goes from a stage zero to a stage four, zero being no scarring at all, and four being very severe scarring, sometimes what we term as cirrhosis. Once you have reached the advanced stages of fibrosis or cirrhosis, you're then at risk for developing liver failure, needing a liver transplant, or developing hepatocellular carcinoma, also known as liver cancer. One important thing to mention is that alcohol can also cause steatosis or fat in the liver. And another important thing to note is that what one person considers as a drink may not be the same as what we in the medical community consider as a drink. For instance, if you're drinking wine, six ounces is equivalent to one drink, 12 ounces of beer, or only one and a half ounces of liquor. And when you drink alcohol on top of fatty liver disease, uh, on, on top of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it can cause progression more rapidly. As far as the necessary lifestyle interventions for fatty liver disease, the crux of the treatment is diet, exercise, and weight loss. There's often a question regarding how much weight you actually need to lose. Uh, this study was based on a large group who were biopsied both before and after weight loss. What we saw was that the patients who had only steatosis, so in the very beginning stages, before they develop any inflammation or scarring in the liver, they could lose as little as 3% of their body weight and still have reversal on their liver biopsy if they were to be repeated. For the most part, if you've already started to develop scarring in the liver, our recommendation is to lose about 10% of your body weight. And with that, you can have reversal of not only the scarring in the liver, but also the fat and the accompanying ballooning and inflammation that occurs in the liver. Now, the way in which you lose weight will be addressed in the remainder of this talk, which is essentially through diet, exercise, and weight loss. So I'm going to pass the torch over to our excellent dietitian, Yvonne Fung, who will speak to you about diet and nutrition for fatty liver disease. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, so now we're gonna dive right into the secret of using food and nutrition to reversing fatty liver. So in summary from what she said, it's really important in order to reverse fatty liver to prevent weight gain and development of obesity um, by watching how many calories that we're eating. And so I wanted to, I added a fun little comic here to illustrate that idea. Um, when it comes to your liver, you are essentially what you eat. So just like this blue bird calling out the red bird with the spots, geez, Bob, how many ladybugs did you eat? pretty clear what they ate because that person looks like, or that bird looks like the ladybug. And the same thing happens with your liver. So I hope during our time together, I can equip you with the knowledge to make better food options and that we can build healthier habits to reverse fatty liver. So can I modify my diet or do I need to follow a completely whole new diet? So some of your meals, might look like the ones shown here, which is completely fine. And we're gonna talk about how to adjust what you're currently eating to a healthier options and choosing better portion sizes, um, while also incorporating your, um, what you're currently eating, your ethnic foods and cuisine. So how can I modify my diet? Here is what we would like to call the healthy plate method. And we're gonna make this plate your frame of reference for any meal that you make. I want you to have this plate in your head every time while you're preparing your meal. Essentially, you want half of your plate to be made of non-starchy vegetables like the spinach and broccoli we see here, a quarter of your plate to be carbohydrates, starches, and whole grains, and the last quarter of your plate to be made of lean protein. 
So it's also good to have a small amount of fat um, to eat with your meals as well, like the avocado. So this style of eating is not only helpful for fatty liver, but also great for other health conditions too, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. The first section we're gonna talk about are the carbohydrates. Okay, so what type of carbohydrates do we see here? So I know we see donuts, white hamburger buns, potatoes, um, candy and muffins. So these are what we call simple and refined carbohydrates. They're really high in sugar and they're typically made out of refined grains. And again, carbohydrates are broken down into sugar as well. And so this, these carbs are white because all the fiber that gives it that brownish color is all taken out. And the fiber is really great for helping you feel full and um, also to regulate your bowel movement. So not all refined carbohydrates look as bad as these ones that I'm showing you here. Other foods that also count are like um, tortillas, flatbreads, chapati, naan, noodles, pasta, Asian breads, concha or Mexican sweet breads, tamales or samosas to name a few. Um, there's also white, white rice, congee, and biryani. So these sugary and refined carbohydrates are highly correlated to fatty liver, liver disease. So instead, we want to try filling up our carbohydrates of complex carbs. And so these are filled with fiber. Um, and some examples here that we can see are like the whole wheat bread, um, the legumes, the beans, lentils, oats. Um, you can do fruit with the skin. These all count as carbohydrates. And so instead of eating, you know, the white bread or the white rice, try to switch over to some whole wheat bread or uh, whole wheat pasta. All right, so how much can we eat? So this is what a typical meal would look like maybe for pasta, and then you would have it with a side of garlic bread. So as you can see here, this entire meal is filled with carbohydrates. And if you remember back to that healthy plate that I showed you, we only want a quarter of our plate to be filled with carbohydrates. So maybe try filling up the other half with vegetables instead of getting garlic bread as your side. So a good amount would be about to aim for a cup's worth of carbs or a quarter of your plate, um, which is about the size of your fist or the size of a baseball if you don't have a measuring cup. Fruit also counts as carbohydrates as well, um, and they are very healthy with a lot of vitamins and minerals and fiber, but they do contain a lot of sugar, and people do tend to eat too much of it because they do think it's good for you, and so we want to try to limit that to about two servings, and one serving is considered um, an apple or an orange the size of a tennis ball or a cup of chopped up fruit um, or grapes or berries, and again, whole grain doesn't mean low calories and doesn't mean you can have more of it. Um, there are just the healthier option and you still want to limit it to a quarter of a plate or about one cup's worth. All right, the next section that we have is the vegetable section. So here we're going to talk about two different types of vegetables. We have the starchy vegetables and then we have the non-starchy vegetables that contain antioxidants and lots of fiber. Some examples of starchy vegetables that we have here are like the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the corn, and the peas. Um, other root vegetables too that you might eat are cassava, Japanese yams, and taro that I don't have pictured here. These starchy uh, vegetables, we actually count these as your carbohydrates. So like your rice and your pasta, we only want a quarter of your plate to be filled with this. Um, instead, what we want you to fill up with the other half of your plate are these non-starchy vegetables here, like broccoli, cauliflower, or carrots, to name a few. These are really low in calories. You can eat as much of it as you want. They have lots of fiber, so they help you feel very full. Um, common vegetables and other cuisines um, that are also great for you to eat that are not shown here are like jicama, nopales or cactus, bok choy, napa cabbage, um, daikon, tomatillo, chayote, bitter melon, and mushrooms. Frozen vegetables are also a great option if you don't have um, fresh vegetables on hand. So how much vegetables should we eat? So again, if you're choosing those potatoes as your vegetables, remember, those count as your carbohydrates. 
And so we wanna try switching it over to some non-starchy vegetables like a broccoli um, that we have here. Um, and then again, trying to do half of your plate filled with these non-starchy vegetables. And you, or you can aim for about one to two cups worth, the size of a, your fist or a baseball. All right, the next section that we have are the lean proteins. So there are different sources of protein. The most common one that we think of are your animal protein sources, such as meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish. Then we have dairy and eggs, like milk, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, or paneer. Um, dairy do contain a lot of fat in it, though, so you do want to choose the lower fat options for dairy. Then we have your plant-based proteins, such as beans and legumes. Um, you also have tofu, dal, nuts, and quinoa. Um, these plant-based proteins are great options as your protein source, but they are lower in cholesterol and saturated fats compared to animal protein. So it's a much better option than the animal protein. Um, and uh, the dairy and the plant-based protein, some of them, like the beans and legumes, do also count as your carbohydrates as well. So just to make note of that. Lastly, you can also get protein from protein supplements, like protein powder, protein shakes, protein bars. Those are fine options too if you don't feel like eating the other sources of protein. But I do recommend whole protein um, is the best, or protein from whole foods is the best. So which proteins to choose? So again, if you're already starting off, you know, with you're used to eating the fried chicken with the skin, and several drumsticks of those, you might want to choose and switch it over to maybe chicken breast that's grilled um, with less, without the skin. Um, that would be a better option. And you want to aim for about three to four ounces or a quarter of your plate, which is the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. Um, the next option, um, if you don't feel, if you're not eating meat, you can also get legumes or beans here, plant-based proteins. And if you're choosing these, you want to aim for about one cup's worth. Again, the size of your fist or a baseball. The last section that we have are your fats. Um, and so fats are found in both animal and plant-based foods. Um, here we see solid fats, um, and these are found in meats, poultry, dairy products, hydrogenated vegetable oils, and some tropical oils like coconut. And these hydrogenated oils, you will find them in baked goods, shortening, uh, pizza, refrigerated dough, fried foods like French fries. So these are high in saturated fats and trans fats. So you do want to eat less of that because those type of fats are known as good for you. The better fats are these unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats like olive oil, um, fatty fish like salmon, nuts, seeds, avocado. Um, oil that is more liquid at temperature is better for your body than the saturated hard fats. And so again, if you are using maybe butter, try to switch over to a liquid oil, such as um, olive oil. And one serving is about one tablespoon. Okay, and so you do want to watch how much fat you're eating because it does have a lot of calories. So try, try to just stick to one serving. Um, if you're doing salad dressing instead of um, fat, you know, Caesar dressing or something made out of cream, try to choose dressings made with oils instead. Instead of high fat dairy like made out of cream, maybe choose some low fat string cheese. Um, and that's about the size of three dice or one ounce or two fingers as your one serving. Nuts are also great and have lots of healthy fats in it too, but you do want to watch how much you're eating because they do have a lot of calories and can add to weight gain. So choose a snack size, which is about a handful or one quarter of a cup. All right, beverages is also really important. Some can increase your risk, some can help um, prevent fatty liver. And so the ones you really want to avoid are those really high in sugar, fructose, or high fructose corn syrup. And so common ones that contain a lot of those sugary items are um, alcohol, fruit juice, smoothies, even though they're made of fruit, again, fruit does have a lot of sugar in it. 
Um, and so I consider the amount of sugar in fruit juice and smoothies to be the same as in a soda. Um, and so you want to avoid those and try not to drink too much of it. Same with Gatorade, energy drinks, sweetened tea, um, other drinks too that are not shown here like boba, milk tea, horchata, mango latte or sweetened coffee, um, or coffee with a lot of sugar or frappuccinos, those all can increase your risk. Better drinks are ones that don't have much calories that are sugar free. So like water, hot tea, coffee without too much sugar or cream added. You can flavor your water with some lemon slices, um, orange slices, you can do sparkling water as well. Those would be great options for you to add um, to your diet um, and have for your, as your beverage. Other things to consider too that you might have heard about. Um, coffee, I know a lot of you, for all you coffee drinkers, um, there is some evidence that shows that coffee can help with um, preventing or improving fatty liver disease and the inflammation caused by it. You have to drink about two cups a day at least, but again, um, and it should be black coffee. You don't want to have all that sugary stuff added to your coffee because that can cause weight gain. But again, I would choose to focus on the diet, whole foods, making sure you're eating the right amount of vegetables um, as your main um, goal. Other things too are adding probiotics to your diet because healthy gut means also a healthy liver. And so you wanna feed good healthy probiotics into your body from yogurt, fermented foods, kimchi, pickles, or miso. Um, and then another thing too is exercise. Exercise is very important, maintaining weight and also doing strength training exercises to get your muscle because Increasing your muscle can also increase your metabolism and help you lose weight as well. So even just 10 minutes a day have been shown to be helpful. So if you're not doing any exercise at all, just go around, do a block around the house after breakfast or lunch um, and build that habit in. Once you get that habit, you can start increasing exercise um, to your goal amount that you want. And the CDC recommends 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise a week. All right, are there any specific diets though um, that can help prevent and reverse fatty liver? And yes, there is one diet that um, a lot of research supports, which is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so the Mediterranean diet is high in those vegetables, fruits, and legumes that we talked about, nuts and olive oil and fish. And that's because they're high in fiber, they're high in antioxidants, and high in unsaturated fats. The Mediterranean diet also is low in red meat, less than one time a week um, that you would consume it, which is low in saturated fats, low in cholesterol, and low in sweets and sugar. And so this diet does show to help prevent fatty liver, but again, you can incorporate this into the way you're currently eating. And so some other, whoops, okay. Um, and so there are um, other diets that you might be considering too or heard about, like the ketogenic diet, the Atkins diet, um, or intermittent fasting. Um, all these diets are okay and they have been shown to help with the initial weight loss, which is also very important for reversing fatty liver, but Long term, you know, it all depends on can you maintain that. So, whichever diet basically that you can follow. So, a healthy diet is a diet that's easy to follow, that's enjoyable, that's long lasting, that you can maintain. And so, it's easier to modify your diet than adopting a whole new diet. You want to make small changes. You know, if you notice you're eating two to three snacks a day, um, try cutting it down to one or two a day or switching to nutrient-dense snacks. Um, if you're eating a lot of white carbohydrates, white bread, try switching it over to whole wheat bread. If you're eating two cups of pasta, try cutting it down to one cup of pasta per meal or cutting out maybe those five cans of sugar, uh, soda a week to maybe just one or two cans. Um, again, you want to continue avoiding alcohol, and if you are eating, maybe eating out like three or four times a week, maybe try to cut that down to two or three times and adding more home-cooked vegetables. So the main thing is keep practicing, focus on building lifelong sustainable
sustainable habits and not just looking at the number on your scale, as I know that can be discouraging. And progress and improvement does take a lot of time. So focus on the journey, focus on building the habits as those are more important than sometimes just achieving your goals. So thank you so much for your time. And next we have Sandy, who is our clinical pharmacist who will be talking to you about medication for fatty liver. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Hi everyone. So next I'll be talking about medications for fatty liver. So uh, despite our best efforts at weight loss, a lot of times patients unfortunately hit a weight loss plateau in terms of their progress. And so we have a lot of patients that come to us and say, I have changed my diet, but I'm not reaching my goal weight. And so this can happen and it's okay. Luckily, we have clinic team members that can help as we have a very robust multidisciplinary team. So as a pharmacist, I can help assess your medications. For example, I can take a look at whether you are taking medications that cause weight gain or contribute to weight gain. If you have diabetes, are you taking diabetes medications with weight loss benefit if you can? And is a weight loss medication option potentially appropriate? So as many of you know, unfortunately, as of right now, there are currently no medications approved by the Food and Drug Administration for fatty liver. So how can we use existing medications to help with fatty liver disease? One way is by using diabetes medications with weight loss benefit. So luckily, there's several classes right now of diabetes medicines that can have weight loss effects. So if you happen to have diabetes in addition to fatty liver disease, the great thing is, is that we can use these diabetes medicines to leverage their weight loss benefit and ultimately help the liver. Some examples of these medication classes are listed here for your reference. And the great thing is about these medications is they also happen to have shown to reduce risk of having a cardiovascular event, such as heart attacks or strokes. So when possible, we try to assess if you're able to be on these medicines and we try to recommend them to your healthcare provider that manages your diabetes. Cholesterol control is also very important, and this is because high cholesterol is a risk factor for fatty liver. And luckily, there are a group of cholesterol-lowering medications called statins, which are very safe to use for most patients with fatty liver disease. Statins help reduce risk of heart attacks and strokes, which we know are very common in patients with fatty liver disease. So it's very important that we not only um, address the issue by treating it with a medication if needed, but that we also screen you for cholesterol on a regular basis. Lastly, weight loss medications are also uh, important to address and see if they're the right option for you. Um, they're indicated when you have a body mass index of 30 or more, or 27 or more with one or more associated risk factor. It's important though that we do not resort to this as a first line option. Lifestyle interventions such as diet that Yvonne discussed is incredibly important and it's important that we, you have tried this for at least six months before we talk about weight loss therapy. And the other thing that is important to recognize is that weight loss medications are not by any means the end all solution. They are meant to help you adhere to a healthy diet. So without maintaining a healthy diet as well as exercise, these medications will not work effectively. Next, I wanna talk about vitamins and supplements. And it's important to understand the general guidance around supplements and vitamins. So unfortunately, supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Therefore, they can have risks such as liver injury or cause interactions with your prescription medicines. So it's very important to always check with your healthcare providers if you're considering starting a supplement or vitamin and get the okay from them first. And if you do get the go ahead, try to look for the supplements or vitamins that have the USP verified label on them. This stands for US Pharmacopeia, which is a nonprofit organization, uh, independent organization that helps regulate and provides a certain set of standards for ensuring the purity and the contents of supplements on the market. And so these are generally more trustworthy. In looking at vitamins in, and supplements in the context of fatty liver disease, there are some vitamins that have been studied. 
For example, vitamin E at a dose of 800 international units per day has been shown to improve inflammatory related liver damage in non diabetic patients with biopsy proven NASH. It is not recommended, though, if you have any kind of bleeding risk, including cirrhosis. So it's really important that you have a discussion with your liver doctor to see if this is the right option for you. There's also been an associated risk factor for pro of prostate cancer with vitamin E. So while it has its benefits, there are definitely risks, so it's important to have that discussion. Omega-3 fatty acids, or fish oil, has been looked at as well. And while there's no evidence to indicate that they directly improve NASH, they are helpful for reducing a particular type of cholesterol called triglycerides. If you cannot be on a statin, or if you need further triglyceride reduction after already being on a statin. Turmeric is another one that comes up a lot with patients. And while generally associated with anti-inflammatory properties, there's no strong evidence for its benefit in NASH. Thank you so much. And next, I will be uh, introducing Dr. Filza Hussein, who's a clinical assistant professor at Stanford, and she's our psychiatrist. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, my name is Filza Hussein, and I'm going to talk to you about some behavioral um, strategies to think about um, weight management. But what I want to do is first start with an overview of why people gain weight. And there's just so many different factors that my colleagues have been talking about. We've talked about some medical conditions, genetic factors. We've talked about dietary trends and habits. We've talked about you know, physical activity. But I also want to make sure that we also talk about some of the social contracts, constructs, such as the socioeconomic status, what the environment is like. And we all know that these then lead to obesity, leading to so many different medical problems. But we should also highlight that it leads to a lot of psychosocial problems also. And so there's so many different reasons that losing weight or making healthy choices is difficult because it's all around us in subliminal ways. We see this on TV where we're bombarded constantly with images of food. And if you look at this image here, they're on different devices, they're sitting indoors and they're being bombarded with these images of food. There's a lot of choices that we are uh, in a sense, there's sensory overload as we walk into supermarkets and the choices can be overwhelming um, and that makes it challenging also. And then of course, the abundance and availability of food around the clock and not necessarily the healthiest of foods. There's also been a shift in how we're utilizing portions. And so my colleagues have talked about portion control, but what I want to highlight with this image is how things have shifted over the number of years, where if you looked at food 20 years ago to looking at food now, it isn't a surprise that obesity and weight um, challenges have become such a big uh, problem for us as a society. And so I want to highlight today a few take home points for you. One of those is that this is a multifactorial problem. And hence, like Dr. Uh, Ahmed is going to show you at the end, it requires a multifactorial approach. And that is what we're hoping to highlight here for you. When we talk about weight management, we talk about you know, food and beverage intake and physical activity. And that equation of food in versus activity out, calories in versus calories out. But we also should look at what is our environment conducive to? What are some of the individual factors? What are choices that we're making? What are some of the behavioral settings and how are those conducive to the choices that we're making? And then what are the societal norms and how those can be addressed as, at a public health level. I will shift gears a little bit and talk more about things at an individual level. And I want to highlight what we call emotional eating. So I want to take you back to thinking about children. When, when infants are in distress, what is it that they do to self-soothe? They would suck on their thumb or they would get a pacifier or they would get a bottle to feed on. And similarly, 
we will see as adults, there are times when maladaptive coping can lead to emotional eating, where it may be a way to suppress or soothe negative emotions. The other thing that I want to highlight is that depression, which we know is a very common mental health disorder and is highly treatable, can have a very huge effect on choices that you're making, both from a dietary standpoint as well as other lifestyle choices. And so there's this bi-directional uh, relationship between depression and diet, where you may have poor appetite, or you may be skipping meals if you're depressed, or you may just not have a lot of motivation to sustain some of the dietary choices and lifestyle choices that you know you should be making. The other thing that I want to highlight is that there are other disorders. So when we think about dietary choices and think about psychiatry, perhaps the term eating disorders comes to mind. And classically, we think about anorexia or we think about bulimia. But the one that I really want to highlight today is binge eating disorder where recurring episodes of eating significantly large amounts of food in a short period of time with a feeling of guilt and feelings of lack of control. So this is a very specific disorder that you have to meet criteria for. However, if you feel like this may be one of the issues that is coming in the way of you maintaining your lifestyle choices and dietary choices, um, then you should talk to your doctor so they can refer you to a psychiatrist. So I've talked about some of the environmental challenges and some of the uh, societal pressures, but what is it that you as an individual can do to incorporate some of the things that my colleagues have talked about in this talk today? I think starting simply with keeping a food diary so that you're keeping a log of all the calories that you are taking. And there's a lot of different apps that you can do that with these days. However, you can also do it old school with paper and pencil and just jot down what you had for breakfast, what you had as snacks, lunch and dinner, and kind of get a stock of what your calorie intake has been like. And then think about cutting down the portion size while you're still eating the same food. So you don't have to drastically change what you're doing, but taking initial steps of just cutting down portion size might be helpful. And then thinking about stressful eating. So we all tend to engage in eating our feelings, meaning emotional eating. So how can we recognize what the impetus is to eat? And then how can, we, how can we try and tame some of those stressful things? Also having a hunger reality check. Am I really eating because I'm hungry? Or am I eating because I'm bored? Am I eating because I'm lonely? Am I eating because I'm sad? Um, and then of course, get support. Uh, so doing this alone, making changes after you've had a particular habit for a long time can be really challenging to do on your own. So getting support is helpful. Fighting boredom, making sure you have other activities to bide your time rather than sitting in front of the TV perhaps and just eating. And then take away temptation. This one really works for me. So if, if there isn't a bag of potato chips or chocolate in the house, chances are that when I am bored, I'm not going to be engaging in those um, behaviors. But also don't deprive yourself because when you have a feeling of deprivation, then there is likely to be this, oh my gosh, I've been missing out. Let me just engorge myself with these foods that I really like. So having treat days or being mindful about the quantities that you're eating, but allowing yourself to enjoy something that you enjoy is also important. And then snacking is not necessarily a bad thing, but choosing healthy snacks with a reasonable um, quantities of carbs and, and protein and fats so that you're not overgoing the limit that you're supposed to. And then learn from setbacks. It's okay to have a setback, especially as you're new in your journey to change your habits. What people tend to do is really beat themselves up and say, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do this. This is such a failure and revert back to previous habits. But I think being kind to yourself and saying, everyone's gonna have setbacks. This is how behaviors are changed. Learning from what were the triggers? What caused me to have the setback? What are some things that I can do differently next time? And then going forth uh, on that journey to healthier lifestyle yet again. 
I do want to give you examples of concrete things that you can do. So watching less TV can be helpful. I showed you images of advertisements on TV and other screens previously. There have been studies to suggest that people who watch more than four hours of TV tend to have more calorie consumption. You'll get enough sleep when you are tired, fatigued, when you are not sleeping well, there is going to be emotional dysregulation and there might be more propensity to eat um, and to self-soothe. Break the mood food relationship. I think that one is really important. Eat when you are hungry, not when you are bored or stressed. Find other ways of dealing with your stress and how we can decrease uh, our stress. And then when you've done everything you can on an individual level, also make sure that you are reaching out to professionals for help. There are a lot of distortions that come with our body image. There are a lot of different challenges that happen with stress and taming stress. Um, and so reaching out for therapy where there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's DBT, which teaches distress tolerance, interpersonal psychotherapy, all of these have been helpful in behavior modification. And so reaching out to your doctors to see what resources you have available and then starting therapy is very helpful. And then most importantly, if there's one take home point that you remember from my talk, that would be treat depression and underlying issues. Talk to your doctor if you think you are suffering from depression, anxiety, perhaps you think you have binge eating disorder. Do talk to them about um, what uh, therapies might be available to you. And I know that there's a lot of concern about psychiatric medications causing weight gain. Talk to your doctor about that. Tell them what your goals are. Tell them that you are worried about your weight because there are medications out there that don't have to gain, have to make you gain weight. And so once you talk to your doctor, you can come up with an individualized plan that works for you. And with that, I um, wish you good health and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Filza, and thank you all the speakers. That was fabulous. I would like to summarize this program by going over our multidisciplinary approach that we follow in our clinic. And here's that slide. Once we have a diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we invite our patient to participate in our dedicated Stanford liver education and awareness program teaching session, which is every six to eight weeks. We also ask them to fill a survey and we get follow-up surveys each time the patient returns to clinic. As you know, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that requires a comprehensive evaluation to rule out a coexisting liver disease. And sometimes that includes a liver biopsy and patients who are interested in a clinical trial are referred to the clinical trials coordinator. Going from left to right on the bottom, uh, we work very closely with our psychiatry team in patients who need help from the psychiatrist. We work closely with the endocrinology team in patients who have diabetes and the lipids disorder team in patients who have high cholesterol levels or other lipid disorders. The liver pharmacist coordinates the care. I must say, Sandy Salem, who was part of this program today, is really the backbone of this multidisciplinary approach that we follow in our clinic. And then to the extreme right, we assess patients and refer them for liver transplant evaluation, for bariatric surgery, and other referrals that they need. And this is really what we do in our clinic. It took two to three years to develop this. And we're very proud of our program and what we do for patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and we hope to improve our program by starting a multidisciplinary board in the near future. With that, I will thank all the speakers who will now become the panelists and answer some of the questions that you have all asked. Thank you so much for attending and uh, let's start the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. If all the panelists can just show their video at this time so we can do the Q&A. I was sorting through the questions here, and um, the first question, uh, Amanda, Dr. Chung, for you, uh, in terms of 
what is the lifespan of an untreated NAFLD patient? And, uh, you know, you, you talked about reversibility and um, uh, is the disease reversible? Yeah, sure. So the the life when we're talking about lifespan of uh, fatty liver disease and FLD, there's different phenotypes. So there are some people who will have fat in the liver, the steatosis, and never develop complications. And then others will develop the NASH or steatohepatitis, which are the ones that can go on to develop cirrhosis. At this point in time, we're not totally sure why some people will progress to steatohepatitis and others won't. So point being is that some people can have steatosis and not have any liver related complications ever in their life. And then others will go on to develop cirrhosis. We think that from the very beginning stages of fibrosis to cirrhosis, it probably takes at least 15 to 20 years to progress completely to cirrhosis. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so Yvonne, uh, with those slides, it looks like a lot of us are going to have a setback, as Filza was uh, talking about. Uh, and uh, I have a, uh, um, an interesting question. How do I maintain a healthy diet during COVID pandemic uh, and lockdown? So, you know, it may not uh, uh, be pertaining to NAFLD, but uh, an interesting question. Yes, and that is a really good question for this time, and I can relate to this struggle as well. Um, so much of our routine has changed because of the pandemic, and I know staying at home makes food and snacking just more accessible. Um, there's also a lot of uncertainty, which can lead to more stress and anxiety. So I do think uh, with regards to this question, it's really focusing on what Dr. Hussein talked about, all those um, economic or like all those um, environmental, situational, and emotional factors that can cause you to make it harder to follow a healthier diet. So what I would want you to practice at home is trying to think of maybe two of those areas that Dr. Hussein might have brought up um, as the biggest barriers for you. And then we're taking some time to reflect um, on those two barriers and seeing what you can do to make changes in that way. So for example, if you feel like you are snacking a lot, again, maybe, maybe keeping the snack out of the house and not buying it or hiding it away in your cupboard. Um, if you really do want a snack, maybe do it once a day instead of three times a day or trying to swap it out with some other options. Or if you feel really stressed, maybe consider yoga or meditation or some other ways that you think um, can help you uh, manage during this time. Thank you. Uh, second question for you, Yvonne. Uh, you mentioned olive oil and butter, but what about the coconut oil and the saturated fats in it? Yeah, so some, some say coconut oil is great. Um, there is a lot of saturated fat in coconut oil. And so again, I would still lean towards the more, um, the fats that are liquid at temperature because they have more unsaturated fat. So I would stick with the olive oil and the vegetable oil. Another question for you, Yvonne, uh, what about how do you quantify the plant-based proteins in legumes and you know, the starch in it also? Yeah, so, so I did mention that the legumes, they do count as your carbohydrates. And so a lot of times if you are managing how much carbohydrates you're taking, if you total calories wise, it's about the same, but if you are concerned about diabetes, um, then it would be good to try to add plant-based proteins that don't have a lot of carbohydrates in it. So looking into uh, tofu um, or things like that, or if you want to do dairy-based, like a Greek yogurt that's not flavored, there's not much sugar in it. But you do have to count those carbs in uh, plant-based uh, proteins. Sandy, a question for you. You, you covered vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids, turmeric. What about milk thistle? and resveratrol. Yeah, so milk thistle um, does have, there are some uh, correlations and it's been looked at for liver disease in general. Um, resveratrol is a substance that's found in plants and it, it basically helps plant fight, uh, plants fight tissue or uh, any kind of uh, tissue damage. It's been studied as well, but I have to say with both uh, sub, uh, supplements, there's no evidence directly for benefit in NASH. And in general, I can't emphasize this enough, supplements can be very, um, you know, risky. So it's important to 
uh, always discuss it with your healthcare provider before starting one because a lot of times I find that they sometimes do more harm than good just because they're not studied in any, you know, they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, as I mentioned. Um, so we don't know about what's truly in there, um, what the contents are in terms of inactive or active ingredients. Yeah, when you ask a hepatologist, we get scared when we hear supplements. Uh, and so we usually say no to supplements. Uh, I'll um, ask uh, Dr. Chung the next question. Um, Amanda, um, uh, Yvonne talked about the Mediterranean diet, but what about the keto diet and Atkins diet, you know, from a hepatology standpoint, just shedding light in terms of what is the risk of this diet to a NAFLD patient? So although the keto diet and the Atkins diet, they, they are very attractive and you'll hear lots of people say they successfully lost um, a significant amount of weight with these diets. Um, I think short term, maybe it's okay, but long term, what I worry about is that these diets really aren't controlled as far as how much saturated fat you end up eating. And we know that's very closely correlated with cardiovascular disease. So we didn't touch on it very much, but in the population of patients who have fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease is actually um, the greatest risk of morbidity and mortality, even over liver-related disease. So I worry very much about people's heart disease or potential for heart disease if they were to follow a keto diet or an Atkins diet long-term. Good answer. So the related question, you know, it, uh, it was asked by Alex in Las Vegas. Um, he's heard of a new term, MAFL, that was not in our first slide. And what is that? Yeah, so we are, it, you know, I think that that term is used, is maybe will start being used to replace NAFLD. Um, and part of the reason is because when we say fatty liver, technically that also includes alcohol-related liver disease. And you can certainly have both. Um, so MAFLD is, instead of the N as an M, and it's for metabolic um, associated fatty liver disease. And so it is, um, the proponents of this term are mainly that it may be a bit more descriptive and accurate for the people who have associated conditions like diabetes and high cholesterol and high uh, lipids. That's, that's good. So, you know, and these patients are usually uh, more heavier order, so they have more advanced disease and uh, maybe we'll describe ma uh, label MAFLD, uh, have a label MAFLD for patients who have more advanced liver disease. Yvonne, question for you. Um, you talked about coffee. I was at a course where it was recommended that we should put olive oil, oil in coffee and drink it. Uh, it'll be even more healthier. What about the green tea? Yeah, so um, there are so many supplements that I'm sure people have a question about. Um, so we didn't get to touch upon green tea. There is some evidence that shows that green tea can um, improve your liver enzyme levels, your cholesterol levels, uh, maybe decrease your BMI with some green tea intake. Um, there hasn't been any liver biopsy, so we haven't seen any improvement in the actual liver, but in the lab, it can help. Um, however, you don't want to overconsume green tea as it does contain caffeine and aluminum. So if you drink a lot of it, it can inhibit iron absorption. So if you have anemia, heart issues, renal failure, you know, you want to take it with caution. Um, the other thing too, if you're looking into extracts of green tea or any supplements, um, you really want to be careful of that. I would, for green tea, um, if, uh, for extracts, um, there's a recent toxicology report that came out this year, and it shows that it can cause drug-induced liver injury and failure. And so no safe amount has been determined for a green tea extract. So if you were to add any green tea or any type of extract of any food, um, I would stick to the whole foods. If you do green tea, drink it in moderation, one to three cups a day. Um, and I would just stick with the food and not try to avoid supplements because there can be contamination. Um, in addition, the extract alone can cause liver injury. You're right. We've seen several cases that we, and we've never been able to explain to the patient what happened, but, but one has to be careful. Um, the next question is interesting question. And uh, as you know, we in, live in California and a lot of our NAFL patients are Hispanic. So here's an attendee who says, I'm a Latino man. 
and what you're showing doesn't attract me. So how do I go about eating healthy? And uh, you didn't show a smaller burrito, which was more healthy. And uh, so, you know, uh, Evan, what do you have to say to that? Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, in general, a lot of nutrition recommendations are geared towards the American or the Western diet. Um, but if you do see a dietitian, they should be addressing your concerns and the, incorporating the foods that you're eating from your cuisine um, into a healthy diet. They can all be included if you're eating, you know, you're just eating Mexican food or Asian food or Indian food. They can all be incorporated into a healthy diet. And so I did try um, in my presentation to try to give a lot of different examples of other ethnic foods um, um, to help uh, with that. Dr. Hussein, um, I know asking you a question is getting a lecture from you. So um, uh, signs of binge eating disorder, like my wife was telling me yesterday, you're binge eating, that's why you're gaining weight. I've gained like 10 pounds in the last three months. And uh, so, you know, is there an easy way for somebody to seek uh, attention and how to go about it? Absolutely. I'll try and keep my answer brief so it doesn't feel like a lecture. Um, the, the cardinal signs of binge eating disorder would be if somebody is eating a substantially large amount of food in a very short period of time. So say over a two hour period, if you're eating six big burritos and a whole large pan pizza, and your so food that you're eating more than anybody else would be able to put away, associated with feeling a lack of control. I can't stop eating this. I need to eat this. And also associated with feelings of guilt, feeling like you need to hide when you're doing this, feeling ashamed of this behavior, and uh, you know, kind of beating yourself up over it, but feeling that lack of control. That specifically would be binge eating disorder. And if you are experiencing that, please talk to your doctor um, because there are medications that might be helpful. There is, um, you know, there's evidence based to suggest that CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, can be very helpful in challenging some of these distortions and some of these behaviors. The next question is also for you. Um, depression uh, is associated with weight gain, but the attendee is asking a question that in depression, people don't eat. So how do they get fatty liver? And what is the role of medication here? Sure, that's a really great question. So, you know, when we learn about depression, we learn that people's appetites are suppressed during depression. They don't feel like eating. That is true as far as just, you know, reading about the disorder, but everyone is different. There are people with depression who will overeat because they're feeling so sad and they're self-soothing. There are people who will skip a lot of meals and then eat um, one large meal. There are people when you're skipping meals, again, your metabolic rate is going down. So there's a lot of different changes happening in your body that will eventually lead to more fat stores and hence perhaps lead more to uh, developing fatty liver disease. Um, and things that you can do to help your depression actually help with um, maintaining a healthy uh, nutrition status as well. So, you know, all the things that we've talked about in this presentation, exercise, fighting boredom, but also talking to your doctors about treatment for depression. And psychiatric medications are notorious for weight gain, but talking to your doctor so that an individualized plan can come into play. There are medications, like Sandy was saying, like all of us are saying, have a multidisciplinary approach where they choose medications that don't cause weight gain, but treat your underlying depression. Thank you. Um, it's almost six o'clock, but we lost five minutes and I see 170 people there. So I'll continue to ask questions and, and whoever joined on time and needs to leave can leave, but I like to cover this uh, very quickly and we'll keep going on. Uh, and um, um, uh, Sandy, um, statins, but statins can cause abnormal liver tests. Uh, is the question. So, uh, you know, and you recommended it. And I re I always tell my patient benefits outweigh the risks. So um, how do you answer that question? Yeah, so statins uh, have been associated with potential liver injury or elevation in enzymes. However, that risk is, I think, incredibly overblown and um, it's very low. The risk is essentially incredibly low. And so in the fatty liver disease population specifically, 
the benefit of the cardiovascular protection much outweighs any risk. There's definitely situations where if your liver enzymes are, you know, if we don't know the, the cause of your liver enzyme elevation, then that needs to be figured out first uh, before we start something that could potentially, you know, affect it. Um, but, but if we know that it's because of fatty liver, then starting a statin is, is incredibly safe. As we've done in several <laughs> cases. Amanda, what do you do with statins and uh, how do you follow a patient? Do you yes, check labs more frequently? Yeah, we know there, f for a lot of patients, there is a period of accommodation where the liver is essentially learning how to process the statins. So I usually try not to actually check the, uh, the liver test too soon because that's when everyone starts getting really worried and anxious. And then there's this whole cycle of starting and stopping it again. So I usually wait at least three to six months, which is a decent amount of time to allow the liver to accommodate and to see if that particular enzyme that is used to break down or to metabolize that particular statin. Um, and one important thing to note is that the, while statins are a class of medications for lipid lowering, um, each statin, they, they're not all broken down by the same enzyme. So if you truly have a problem where your liver has not accommodated to that particular statin, but you need the lower therapy, you can always try a different one that is broken down by a different enzyme. Thank you. Um, Yvonne, what about um, South, South Beach diet and a meal plan? And, uh, you know, when I started doing fatty liver, I would tell my patients that um, eat less than 100 grams of carbohydrates per day, but uh, um, Niha corrected me and said that you'll never be successful. And so she moved it to 150. So answer those questions for us. What do we do and how do we recommend um, to our attendees uh, where to go with this? You're muted. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of attendees asking about um, all, many different types of diets. There are so many out there. And again, low fat, low carb, which one to follow, South Beach. Again, um, I don't want you to think of this diet as like a special diet. I want you to incorporate the, you know, the healthy plate method that I talked about, um, making small adjustments with what you're already doing to try to focus on eating more vegetables, being more plant-based. I don't want you to focus on high carb or low carb, but choosing, um, complex carbs over refined carbs. I don't want you to focus on fat versus carbs. I want you to focus on unsaturated fat versus saturated fat. So yeah, the, my recommendation is you don't need to follow any specific diet. Um, I think just focusing on general healthy eating um, because the plate that I showed you leads to a moderate amount of carbohydrate intake, a focus on lean protein, and higher intakes of vegetables, and that is beneficial um, and for all body types and weight and everything. Good. Um, the next question, uh, Amanda, for you, um, in terms of based on severity of liver disease, uh, we're not talking about a statin uh, patient, so somebody who's on statin, how do you follow them? How often do you get labs? How do you uh, decide when you're going, going to get an ultrasound and, and what's your way of uh, monitoring the patient? So it, it probably depends on how much fibrosis or scarring you already have. So if you already have cirrhosis, the, more, the most advanced stage of scarring in the liver, you're at risk for liver failure in the future, as well as more importantly, liver cancer. So you need to have labs and imaging at a minimum every six months, um, and imaging of the liver specifically to um, screen for liver cancer. Outside of that group, anyone else who has fatty liver disease, um, if you have the kind of middle stages of scarring or fibrosis in the liver, so let's say a stage two or a stage three fibrosis, it would be really reasonable to reassess for the degree of fibrosis at least once a year. At Stanford, typically what we do is a fiber scan, which is a type of specialized ultrasound that allows us to measure liver stiffness and estimates the amount of scarring in the liver. And because you typically don't have symptoms with fatty liver disease, even with fibrosis or scarring, we as your physicians have to be the one that are screening for it or looking for it. 
If you have a fiber scan, for instance, that shows fatty liver disease, but shows absolutely no scarring in the liver, so your liver stiffness is very, very low, you can probably go every two to three years on average to have a fiber scan, but it'll be individualized based on what risk factors you have. So for instance, if you have poorly controlled diabetes and or insulin dependent diabetes, you're at a much higher risk for progression. So your provider may choose to order a fiber skin every year. Um, and it doesn't have to be a fiber skin. It's just something that is assessing or estimating the amount of scarring you have in your liver. Another question for you, Amanda. Uh, so, you know, we, tore, we just discussed that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of mortality from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So what about the protective role of alcohol use and who do you allow, who you don't allow? And uh, I usually tell my patients there's no minimal safe level. So, but uh, educate us. Well, we definitely know the unsafe levels. Um, so our, our general guidance for everybody with or without fatty liver disease is that if you have no underlying liver disease and no scarring in the liver, most people, um, women can have one drink a day and men can have two drinks a day. And that's keeping in mind that a drink is defined very clearly by the medical community, which we talked about on the first slide. Um, now, if you have underlying liver disease, the progression to cirrhosis can be much more rapid if you do drink alcohol. And we really don't know what that safe amount of alcohol is. Um, so our general guidance for anybody with underlying liver disease is to uh, minimize alcohol use as much as possible and certainly not to exceed the one to two drinks a day. Once you start developing advanced fibrosis, so if your provider tells you you have stage two or stage three fibrosis, and definitely if you have cirrhosis, then the guidance would be to just cut out the alcohol completely. Great, that was uh, very well done. So um, Yvonne, back to you. You know, patients who have fatty liver disease also can have sleep apnea and sometimes have a hard time going to sleep. What do you think about the CBD oil uh, in um, patients with NAFLD uh, who use it to just go to re relax and go to sleep? Um, you know, actually, I don't encounter this too much, so I don't know if somebody else <laughs> would want to answer. I, I can talk about that. Okay. Um, this, is, this is Dr. Hussein. So the short answer is say no to CBD oil. And the reason why I say that is we heard about how, you know, we don't know a lot about all these supplements and what the effects are on our different organs. There's recent evidence suggesting that CBD may actually not be very good for your heart. And CBD interacts with the different enzyme systems in the liver um, to affect the metabolism of different medications. So if you are somebody who's taking other medications also, the benefits of those medications might not be completely available to you because of how CBD interacts with those enzyme systems. So um, I, I know that it's touted as being natural and it's good for you and it's coming from the earth, but so are so many other things. It's just that we don't have a lot of studies and a lot of data and we're developing those data right now. So if you are able to, and if you do have underlying illnesses, um, I would say stay away from uh, CBD oil. Thank you, Filza, for jumping in. I have a few more questions and we have 150 people. So, you know, I just wanted to explain one thing. When a patient comes into our clinic with NAFLD, we dance and work around. We're the supporting cast for our dietitian. And, um, and uh, when they have a psychiatric disorder, when they have diabetes, when they have a lipid disorder, we bring in those experts and go to them. And, um, uh, Sandy Salem, uh, who is uh, our clinic uh, pharmacist, really is the backbone of our whole program where she helps coordinate all this and contacts the referring physician and we've been very successful. So I wanted to stress, if you look at that um, 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 uh, algorithm that I showed you, uh, you know, every healthy Diet. Um, and, you know, we do a survey on the patient, we provide them uh, follow-up uh, uh, on their uh, follow-up visit, we get a follow-up survey and we give them input and uh, we have educational class, which is going to go virtual, we probably have a board 
and all hepatologists are um, um, part of this uh, program and, um, and, and it's going to be very widespread, hopefully within the hepatology clinic in the next few months, hopefully after the lockdown is over. Now, going to Amanda again, we're, we're jumping to a transplanted patient who asked this question uh, that uh, I had a transplant and um, uh, he's sober now. He's, you know, he's got a good appetite. He's more than six months out. Uh, he's eating and you know, he's gained weight. His ALT has gone up. Ultrasound is showing um, fatty liver uh, and fatty infiltration of the liver. What recommendation do we have for this patient? You know, he's more worried about you put me on like 10 medications. Can one of them be causing all this? Yeah, so that's a great question. And what we're finding is that um, a, a lot of our patients post-transplant start to develop features of fatty liver disease, which is concerning. Um, I don't think we touched on this earlier, but fatty liver disease is a competing for the number one slot for the reason for patients to have liver transplants. Um, so fatty liver disease and alcohol basically competing out for the number one and two slots. But going back to the question, so I, you know, I think it's multifactorial. On the one hand, one of the reasons for developing fatty liver disease post-transplant is that people start feeling better. So they're not sick anymore. And so they start eating more. Um, and ultimately, almost everybody gains weight post-transplant. And we know that that is a driving factor for fatty liver disease. Unfortunately, an additional um, risk factor is that after you have a liver transplant, you do need to be on chronic immunosuppression to avoid rejection of that transplanted organ. And depending on which immunosuppressant you're on, each of them has its own side effects, which may include increasing your risk of developing diabetes or at least insulin resistance and worsening your lipid profile. So it, to some extent, almost sets you up for having or developing fatty liver disease. And so post-transplant, it's very important to be very cognizant of this and your providers will be following these parameters very closely and, you know, advising you to really monitor your weight um, when you're post-transplant to minimize the chances of developing fatty liver disease. Great. Thank you. Yvonne, um, uh, um, you know, uh, Yvonne's title says liver dietitian, but actually it's liver transplant dietitian. Mm -hmm. We took the transplant out because we didn't want people to get uh, you know, what's going on with this uh, webinar here. So Yvonne, um, uh, a quick question uh, in terms of patients who are underweight and have fatty liver disease. Now, you know, uh, some of them are just underweight, but you know, when you have advanced disease uh, and you don't see any features and you see an underweight patient, so how do you, uh, you know, uh, sort of take us through that uh, in patients with advanced liver disease and somebody who's just underweight and maybe Philza will need to help you there because there could be another non serotic cause of being underweight. Exactly. Um, so if we do get patients who are underweight or with fatty liver, and especially those that are preparing for transplant, um, it's really important that we bump up their weight again to make them stronger. And so one common thing that I've noticed is that sometimes people with um, fatty liver, they were overweight at some point and then have tried to lose a lot of weight by cutting out a lot of protein. And so they end up eating a diet mainly based off of fruits and vegetables. And so they end up losing a lot of their muscle and a lot of their strength. So I think an important thing, depending on what stage you're in uh, with the liver disease and the condition is that you're making sure um, you are getting enough calories to maintain the weight, making sure you're eating enough protein so that your body is not breaking down protein um, for energy. Um, and then also exercising again, not only for, you know, if you are trying to lose weight, exercise is good for that, but then strength training too, to rebuild um, that muscle. So it would be different strategies than uh, weight loss that I've, what I've talked about. Um, so it would be individualized for you based on the reasons of why you're underweight. Um, but those are kind of some of the general things that I would tackle. Filza, what about somebody, a young um, girl who's um, uh, used to be overweight and now has um, lost a lot of weight and has a BMI less than 18 uh, um, and is being evaluated for uh, an underlying psychiatric disease where 
a, a dietitian or the nutritionist is unable to help alone. We don't have Filza. Well, I didn't ask her a question, so she got upset and left. I, I'm actually still here. Okay. Um, it seems like I'm having some technical difficulties. Can you repeat the question, please? I'm um, uh, uh, a young a, a young um, 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 patient comes to our clinic who has uh, lost a significant amount of weight and used to be heavy in the past and. The dietitian and the nutritionist is having a hard time working with them uh, in terms of, uh, and you know, it's suspected they have an underlying psychiatric disorder. So, how what is your role there, Filza? I mean, I, I think like much like what we've been talking about, a multidisciplinary approach is extremely helpful, and looping a psychiatrist in to think about specifically what are some of the challenges, what are some of the barriers, is there some self-sabotage happening, is there some other uh, coping things that are coming into play, um, are there other trauma and stress-related things that we need to think about. So having a psychiatrist and having a therapist on board would be extremely helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, Amanda, what about celiac disease and NAFLD? I mean, uh, you know, how do they go uh, along and what is, you know, how do you differentiate between them? Does celiac disease cause NAFLD or is just part of the differential diagnosis? So it's, uh, celiac disease is a whole different disease entity. It, it's part of the differential in the sense that both celiac disease and fatty liver disease can cause liver test abnormalities. So oftentimes when we're meeting a patient for the first time and their liver tests are abnormal, even though we may think um, it's probably due to fatty liver because of all the risk factors present, we often do rule out celiac disease just to make sure that you don't have two diagnoses going on. Um, so as we had mentioned previously is that Fatty liver disease is quite prevalent in society. You know, one in three to one in four people have fatty liver disease. So it, you can definitely have more than one diagnosis. And it's not uncommon in the liver clinic for us to treat people with two diagnoses. There is some data, though the mechanism is not totally understood, but there is some data suggesting that perhaps fatty liver disease could be worsened um, by poorly controlled celiac disease, and that could potentially be due to the decreased gut integrity. But that's still, you know, kind of preliminary data, so um, it's still being investigated. On the flip side, there's also been seen is that if somebody has really poorly controlled celiac disease, they often lose weight and can actually become malnourished. So then once you treat the celiac disease, they start eating more, they regain the weight, and then that weight gain actually lends itself to developing fatty liver disease. So there are some tie-ins to some extent, but they are two separate entities. Thank you. Yvonne, what about this residual sugar and kombucha? Um, it's, it's fine. Like um, there's a little bit of sugar in the kombucha. Again, um, I do try to limit the amount of sugar that you get from beverages because usually the amount that you're getting from food is completely meets your calorie needs. Um, but kombucha doesn't have very much sugar compared to soda um, or juice. So it's, it's a fine option. And I know there are questions about probiotics too. And yes, it's not just marketing. Um, there is evidence that um, promoting good gut bacteria um, and having a diverse gut bacteria um, is linked to a healthier weight and having a non-diverse gut bacteria is linked to obesity. Um, and then the gut bacteria and how healthy your microbiome is, is also linked to your liver health. So yeah. if you do want to incorporate some kombucha or probiotics or kefir, um, those are great options. I think it's fine. Yeah, somebody asked this question, is fermented food okay? So, uh, and you, you touched on it. Uh, can yeah. you just, you know, um, answer that specific question? Um, yeah, so fermented foods have great amount of probiotics. So again, if you want to diversify how much probiotics you have in your gut, it would be great to add um, um, eating fermented foods. But the only thing that feeds these probiotics to keep them alive is the fiber from vegetables. And so that's why I highly recommend a more plant-based, making sure you're eating enough vegetables 
Um, because even if you're feeding yourself those probiotics, um, but if you're not giving the food to the probiotics to keep it alive, it won't help very much either. Um, if you're looking at supplements too, um, lactobacillus has the most um, evidence for that as well. So um, products like Culturel that have that one specific strain um, could be something you could look into as well if you were interested in um, that the only supplement that I would say is okay. <laughs> so I've been asked this question a couple of times. This is not part of the, the, what we have here. What is the difference between fermented and processed food? And you know, some of our patients think they're both the same, which is not true. So can you just touch on this real quick? Um, processed foods are just typically foods that are just not in their original form. And so they, it doesn't, most of the times processed food is broken down and nutrients are extracted from it, fiber is extracted from it. Um, fermented foods are made completely differently where just over time, um, uh, it just takes time for that bacteria to be created and fermented. Um, and so that's just the process of it and only in that fermentation process do you get that bacteria. So it's very different than processed foods, which we mostly consider as um, like packaged items. And you select out the uh, favorable bacteria. And, you know, I tell my patients sometimes that uh, just go to whole food and you'll get fermented food, but not processed food. Exactly. Uh, and and then was... the, yeah. And then the heat process too does kill the probiotics. So if you cook any of your fermented foods, um, doing anything through heat, that will kill the probiotics as well. So Filza had to run, um, but Amanda, Sandy, uh, uh, Yvonne, anything that we have missed that you'd like to stress, um, um, you know, we still have, uh, you know, going down to 116, including all of us. So um, um, any closing remarks from each one of you? Yvonne, <laughs> I guess, thank you um... for the great job. <laughs> Thank you. And I know everyone wants the magic bullet and the magic diet. And so I'm really trying to emphasize just a general healthy diet um, within those guidelines that I shared. If you want to follow a specific diet, don't follow a diet that cuts out an entire food group. That is not a balanced diet. Um, and if you do really want to follow a specific diet, again, the Mediterranean diet is a very well-balanced diet that has been shown to help. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's a lag, but if I had anything to say, I would say that, um, as we mentioned earlier, it's very much a multidisciplinary approach. And so, and regarding medication specifically, if you feel like, you know, you have general questions about your medications or you're concerned that they may not be right for you, or they're, they're sort of, especially if you have a lot of uh, people taking care of various conditions you may have, it can get difficult to make sure everyone's talking to one another and um, sort of aligned in their goals of ensuring that you're, uh, you, know, you know, you're not, you're reaching your goal weight. Because um, so many of these things can be related to one another when we don't think they are. And so um, just make sure all of your providers are talking to each other. And if you have questions about your medication, ask about it. Um, you know, we don't want to, we want to make sure patients are not um, having too many medications added without kind of, they, they, them understanding why am I on each medication? Are they interacting? Are they helping me reach my goals in terms of my chronic conditions? Um, so yeah, that's the only thing I would stress is just make sure that you're having these discussions and asking these questions. I have to say, Sandy has helped me develop several protocols and, and, and it's really uh, energy in our liver clinic that we've been able to do so many things. Amanda, any uh, closing remarks? Anything that we may have missed? I don't think so. I, I guess I'll piggyback on everyone else and just say, I, you know, I think that having multiple disciplines uh, involved are very important. You know, as the hepatologist, we obviously recognize the importance of insulin resistance and uh, dyslipidemia and obesity playing a role in all of this, but we don't necessarily have um, the means to treat all of these comorbidities. So we pull in a lot of resources and other people um, for their help. 
Um, the one thing I guess we, we haven't touched on at all, just to throw it out there, and I know it's not the purpose of uh, this uh, talk or conference, is just um, for those who are obese, morbidly obese, that bariatric surgery is also a possibility in um, the uh, patients can talk to their providers about the appropriateness of that because it can and has been shown to reverse fatty liver disease as well. Great, thank you. Um, as a closing remark, I would like to thank Ray Kim and the GI administration to come up with this great idea and giving us the opportunity to share with you what we do in our hepatology practice as a group. And, um, and, um, and um, hopefully um, this webinar will be uh, um, available to you on YouTube. And if you subscribe, you will get that link. And um, um, there are a couple of people, Trevina and Jeff, who helped me uh, through each step of this, uh, you know, I didn't even know how to open Zoom uh, two months ago, and uh, now we're at this level. And um, and there's uh, this person, Shannon Judd, who you see on the top of the screen. Uh, if she goes to Hollywood, uh, she would uh, make a lot. She can make a whole movie, uh, and she's uh, you know so gifted in terms of uh, getting all our talks together and. Uh, present, you know, making this presentation uh, so successful. So Shannon, thank you. And um, 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 you can reach out to us, uh, ask more questions. I still see a hundred people, so, uh, but we've gone way over. So uh, I will end here uh, and um, um, uh, hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.